Good morning, good afternoon, and maybe even good evening. Welcome to this, uh, this webinar that is organized by the Sustainability Committee of DFI on Sustainability. My name is Gerald Verbeek. I'm the chair of the Sustainability Committee, and hopefully we can give you some better understanding of what sustainability is, is all about. As we were talking about sustainability in the Sustainability Committee, we felt that it was necessary to have a, a webinar to really show to you how American companies are dealing with sustainability. But before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. As you can see, all attendees during this webinar are gonna be muted. And the structure of the webinar is that there's gonna be an opening statement by the four participants, or the four panelists. Uh, after that, there will be a extended Q&A where we hopefully can explore some of the issues that uh, we've been talking about, but also address your questions. And you can use the chat box or the question box uh, in, uh, in Zoom to convey those questions so that I can then as moderator uh, pose those questions to the participants. Let me give you a little bit of background to, to set the, the scene for, for this webinar. The question that office, uh, often comes up is, what is sustainability? And as a sustainability committee, we have gone back to the 17 sustainable development goals that the United Nations has, has put forward to, to really emphasize that sustainability is more than only climate related issues, that there's really a wide range of, of issues that, that uh, are all part of sustainable efforts. But then the question that often comes up is that people feel, well, should I really get involved in that? Does it make sense for me, for my company to really get involved in that right now? Or is it something that we only should be doing in the future? And that's why as a sustainability committee, we thought it was useful to ask four executives of American companies to convey why they believe that sustainability is something, something that you as a company and the foundation industry should focus on. And therefore we've invited four speakers, Eric Droof from Keller North America, Seth Perlman from Menar, Victor Romero from Macmillan Jacobs, and Sue Frank from TEI Rock Drills. And you may wonder why did we ask those four individuals? What we try to do is cover all kinds of companies, large and small, engineering firms, contractors, uh, suppliers of equipment, to, to really get a focus from different angles on the same topic. So while these individuals may and not always deal in exact with the same type of clients or in, are in the same business, by giving you their views on, on this topic, hopefully all the attendees of this webinar will have somebody that they can relate to, somebody that represents the type of work that they're involved with to, to see, to show that sustainability really makes sense. That's the, the short introduction. And what I would like to do now is ask uh, the, the first speaker, Eric Trove, to give his opening statement. Eric, the floor is yours. Thanks, Gerald. Uh, first and foremost, good morning. Uh, I'm Eric Trove. I'm a geotechnical engineer and I'm the president of Keller in North America. Uh, Keller is a UK based, publicly traded, and is the largest geotechnical construction company, both globally and in North America. We can design and deliver uh, over 50 geotechnical solutions. Excuse, let me get my slides caught up here. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. We can deliver over 50 geotechnical solutions uh, anywhere in uh, North America. So, how will we really want to be remembered? You know, do we want to be remembered for our lack of representation compared to the rest of society, our inability to cut carbon when other industries have pushed the limit? Will we be remembered as the cause of pollution in our communities? Or will we be remembered for installing foundations that took tons and tons of carbon emissions to build and install? I think. Thinking about our legacy, I think helps us forge ahead to do more when it comes to sustainability. You know, do we wanna be on the right side of history? Do we wanna lead the industry in this area and bring people along with us? Do we wanna mitigate the risks with sustainability and particularly climate change? 
we know client demand is growing, so there is a financial opportunity to do the right thing. Uh, in the United Kingdom, we're already starting to see jobs won based on our sustainable practices. And I think this is certainly a harbinger of things to come within North America. There'll also be some legislative pressures and it won't just be California, it'll spread across the country. As Keller is a publicly traded company, we actually feel investor, investor pressure you know, to be proactive in sustainability. And what's probably most important is we wanna satisfy our employee concerns that there wants when it comes to how we affect our community and our planet. And we also wanna build a diverse workplace as a diverse and inclusive workplace is really the best place for everyone. So how do we actually do this? Uh, let me go back up. So Keller has created what we call our 4P approach, where we focus on our planet people and principles, principles to support successful projects. These are aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals that Jared, Gerald spoke of a few minutes ago because they're holistic and they address all pillars of sustainability and they're universally accepted. With regard to the planet, for 2022, our approach to the environment is to continue to reduce one and two emissions, which is generally fuel and electricity. We're also establishing a baseline for scope three emissions, which is mostly embodied carbon in the materials we use. Keller has been involved in the DFI IFC carbon calculator, and we're training our engineers to use it to calculate embedded emissions in our foundation solutions. We're actively pursuing innovations that can help us reduce our environmental footprint to reduce our fuel con consumption and to reduce embodied carbon of materials when, that we put in the ground. Pushing innovation is exciting and a fun way for our employees to be actively engaged. Our approach to people is a focus internally to build upon our safety program to grow in ways that increase the well being of our employees. We want to continue to improve our policies. In fact, this past year, we restructured our parental leave program to better support all new parents in Keller. We're developing, growing, uh, we're developing and growing uh, employee affinity groups, starting with Keller's women's group, which is Keller Women in Construction, or QUIC as we call it, which was actually recently featured in the ADSC magazine. We're structuring how we recruit to increase representation and in retention of both women and people from underrepresented groups. We continue to supply our employees leadership with professional organizations such as DFI. We have a scholarship program for employees pursuing graduate degrees and our local branches are empowered to support their local communities through donations and volunteerism. With regard to governments, governance, we're aligning our reporting with the task force for climate related financial disclosures to better understand the risks of climate change to our organization and to further inspire our call to change. We'll continue to report on gender pay gaps and gender representation within our company. And we're also working to forge strategic partners to help us meet our goals with respect to the planet and our people. For example, we don't build engines that go into our equipment or manufacture cement that we use so often. So we have to work with these partners to meet our targets in all these areas. Finally, we think by excelling with regards to our planet people and principles, we have even more success when it comes to our projects. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Thank you for uh, your opening statement uh, to, to really show what, what Keller is doing. The second uh, panelist is Seth Perlman with, with Menar. Seth, the floor is yours. Gerald, thanks a lot for organizing this and uh, thanks for letting me participate. Uh, like Keller, I, I work for a global company. Uh, we have a specialty group inside it called Solitange Fresne, but we sit underneath this big global group called Vinci with over 200,000 employees and over 50 billion euros of uh, revenue. Uh, but we, and on the geotechnical side as Menar, we consider ourselves global design builders. And, uh, and just, and while Keller is quite, is the biggest, we're all the geotechnical activities inside our company, we, we like, we're, we're considered number two. 
Um, so you may think of us as a European company, but I wanted to point out that inside Vinci in North America, we're doing just in US and Canada over $4 billion worth of work. And it's not all geotechnical. A lot of it is a very high carbon producing thing as we're very large in the asphalt paving business. About half of that at least is asphalt paving. But so I started thinking about what we want to say on this thing. And, and I'm looking back in my files and I found in 2008 in the DFI magazine, there, they interviewed me about sustainability. And we were obviously been thinking about this for quite a long time. And it's, it's easy to try to implement things, but it's very hard to measure. But what we said in 2008 is still true today. And that no matter what your motivation is for wanting to create a more sustainable world, if you don't do it, you're going to be left behind competitively. If we don't drive continuous improvement, if we don't drive innovations that help to bring down carbon, when you bring down that carbon, you're also generally bringing down the cost. If you need half the cement, you spend half the money on cement. It's a very, very simple concept. So going back, clearly though, to respond to, you know, we're a huge publicly held company. We're under the, we're the biggest contractors in France. We're under the microscope from the stockholders. And that's not the only motivation, but the company has put out a lot of information about this. We're doing it across all business lines. And, and there's been a, for sure on the greenhouse gas side, an absolute directive that we bring that down by 40% in 2030. And I think by 2030, and many other companies are announcing what they're trying to do to do that as well. The harder part is looking at everything we build and how that carbon is generated across the entire value chain. So what, what do you build and how is it used and how do you make things better? In terms of measurement, Vinci is trying to measure. So this is all, I'm not gonna go through this, a very dense slide, but this is all on the website in there this is all publicly available information if you're interested in seeing what they're doing what we are doing as a company to try to reduce this across our business lines um, so in a nutshell you know it is everyone's responsibility whether you believe in global warming or you don't it's not an american problem it's not a french problem or a british problem it's a global problem and it really has three main areas climate resources and natural environments, at least with respect to the physical sustainability part. Um, I'm not gonna address the, the human side in this batch of slides. Um, okay. So as Menard, you know, as a smaller part of this big entity, we have started to try to measure. And this scope one and two is, the, is kind of the easy stuff. It's, you know, as more electric pickup trucks come to market, we'll get them. We've even got a couple of superintendents driving hybrid SUVs rather than pickup trucks if they don't need them. So you can, you can do that stuff. But the scope three is the low fruit, and that's going to require more fundamental changes in the way we build things. As Eric said, we need to put pressure on our suppliers and partners to change what they're bringing to market. And many of the big global cement companies are already doing that. They're trying to make greener cements. We need to think about alternative materials. We need to convince our clients that there's a better way to do it with less waste. On the paving side, we can recycle a road with zero new asphalt, but talk to all the state DOTs and ask how many of them are willing to accept that technology at this stage. And I think you'll find it's very few. So we've come up with this little internal thing we call less is more Menard. You know, uh, Menard is, is a focused solely on ground improvement. We're not doing diaphragm walls or large board piles or things like that. So we always felt that ground improvement was inherently greener. And so the low fruit for us isn't necessarily just in the techniques we do, but in how we help our clients optimize their structural content because there's a lot of money that goes into grade beams and structural floors and other things and footings that are oversized and other things where we think we can take carbon out of these projects and we need to work together with our clients and, and design partners to help that happen. Um, so we've developed this little thing, less is more. 
less is Menard. We're always trying to optimize our designs. We've created this little internal thing, and some of our guys are promoting it externally. Less is more Menard. You know, more ground improvement is going to result in more sustainability or less carbon. And internally, it takes some work to train the people, to look at materials, to look at our vehicles, to look at our plants and equipment. You know, but we'll be first in line for hybrid rigs. We're, we're building some hybrid uh, Contech rigs right now, for example, for soil exploration. We're looking at the way we operate these machines to burn less fuel. That's kind of the low fruit. That's what we know we can do. The cement is a, a bigger thing. That's where the big money is. And then also recycling. So in our business, being willing to use recycled materials is critical. So it gives you some sense of what we're trying to do right now. It's, uh, it takes a lot of cultural change to get there, but we're committed to it. Thanks, Seth. You're welcome. After your two presentations or opening statements by contracting firms, and we shift the focus just slightly to engineering firms, and I'm uh, glad that uh, Victor Romero from McMillan Jacobs has uh, agreed to participate in this webinar. So, Victor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gerald. Um, just a little bit about my company, um, McMillan Jacobs Associates, and uh, I'm Victor Romero. I'm the I'm the president. Um, we're a 500 person engineering and construction company, but mostly design engineering. We have 22 offices, um, mainly based in the USA, but we also have uh, offices in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. So we have a, a bit of an inter international footprint. Um, we're specialists. Um, we are primarily involved in underground infrastructure and water resources engineering. Uh, and our work has had a basis in sustainability before it really became prevalent uh, in the water, wastewater, and transportation and energy markets. And I'll get a, in, into that a little bit later. Okay, so as a company, how do we define sustainability? Um, we use the three pillars method um, that is uh, used by most of the sustainability uh, frameworks uh, that are in use by the industry. Um, we defined sustainability as meeting the needs of the present without compromi compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And we do that by the simultaneous application of environmental, social, and economic improvement, or sometimes referred to as uh, people, planet, and profits. And when you can uh, align those, those, three, um, uh, those, those three items, um, you've got a sustainable development or a sustainable project. Um, we, uh, are, as a company, we aspire to achieve sustainability in our, in our uh, operations of our company, but where we can have the biggest impact on improving uh, sustainability is in uh, the design, delivery of design and construction for our clients. Okay, so why does sustainability make sense for engineering firms, which is the central question that Gerald uh, posed to all of us here on the panel. Well, first of all, it is the right thing to do. It promotes a culture of shared responsibility for sustainable outcomes that always, well, when it's applied, it improves the projects and the quality of life. And that's what, why we're really here. Most of us are engineers. That's why we're here is to improve, uh, improve, deliver improved projects and quality of life for the public. Um, also, when we use sustainability frameworks uh, in our in delivery of our projects, it, pro it helps us proactively manage risks and opportunities, which uh, we should have been doing all along, but it, it's just another overlay of how we manage risks and opportunities, and it enhances operational performance for our clients, which supports their long-term interest. And finally, when we're asked by our clients to efficiently use or reuse resources, um, it drives us to uh, new ways of thinking and continual innovation uh, and how we can achieve those goals. So we're always, uh, we're, we're striving to think up of new ways uh, to uh, enhance, enhance the use of resources. Um, another reason, very important reason why sustainability makes sense uh, for us as an engineering firm is clients are asking us to deliver uh, sustainable projects uh, under the appropriate rating schemes and standards. So, you know, we are seeing now more and more in our projects that clients want us to use Envision or ISCA or LEED in order to measure sustainable outcomes. 
Um, and then another uh, requirement we are seeing more and more from clients is they want resilient projects uh, or, you know, during the life of the project, they want to have a, a more resilient project uh, that can uh, uh, um, meet the, the needs of climate change um, and other threats, um, other environmental threats, uh, and they want to reduce uh, carbon emissions on their projects. Uh, and then finally, sustainable uh, projects achieve a positive uh, benefit for the environment and the com community. Um, it, it, the public sees that the project is being delivered as in, a, in, a, in a way that's a value for money and at least positive legacies for our internal team, for our clients themselves and the end user, who are the, the, the users uh, who are either our clients or our communities. Okay, so as I said at the beginning and to wrap up, um, you know, most of what we've been doing all along is sustainable. It's just now that we're uh, uh, measuring it through sustainability frameworks. Um, most of our underground structures, our tunnels, deep shafts, they're built to enhance mass transit, improve resiliency of water delivery or improve the quality of our waterways. And reducing waste or conserving uh, uh, conserving materials or energy or reusing materials, uh, it saves money. And this is one thing I do want to leave with the group that a lot of times when people are first engaged with sustainability on a project, they think it's going to drive up project costs. Uh, but as Seth mentioned, you know, um, uh, if, if we're conserving materials and energy, we're actually saving money on the project. And of course, efficiency is one of the pillars of good engineering uh, and as part of our ethics. Thank you uh, for for your views on this this whole thing, and it's it's interesting that you mentioned uh, that it's being more sustainable saves money. Um, some of you may know that I'm also moderating a uh, DFI webinar series called uh, "Increased Testing Saves Money." Maybe we should uh, have a separate series called "Increased Sustainability Saves Money," but that's for a later date. Uh, after contractors and engineering firms, it only makes sense that we also get uh, somebody. Uh, here is part of the panel that deals with equipment manufacturing, and that's why I've uh, asked uh, Sue Frank to join us. Uh, she heads up uh, TI Rock Drills. Sue, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Gerald. Um, so TEI Rock Drills is a manufacturer of um, micropile drilling attachments, and then we also have um, limited access rigs. I thought I would concentrate more on what we do internally as a manufacturer to reduce our impact um, on the environment. Let's see. There we go. Oh, it went. I'm not sure how to go back. I'm sorry. It wasn't working and I clicked too many. There we go. So um, for us in business, um, what does sustainability really mean? And um, I looked up the definition. I thought that this um, definitely reflected TEI's views on it, that sustainability refers to doing business without negatively impacting the environment, community, or society as a whole. Um, one of the things that several of the things that we do at our manufacturing um, is we actually collect our waste oil, which is then picked up by another company, um, construction company that reuses it as fuel oil. Um, we have geothermal heating that we actually drilled, um, drilled in and put into our warehouse. So we use geothermal heating and cooling. And then we installed our new dust collection system for our, uh, for our shop that provides clean air for our employees. And then it also reduces the emissions that we're putting out into the environment. Um, just, we have an aggressive recycling program, hydraulic hose, things as simple as hydraulic hose reels, metal chips, wastewater, hydraulic oil, cardboard, aluminum, LED lighting, um, even our coolants and uh, solvents that we use and our, our paint thinners, 
they're all environmentally friendly and recycled. Um, one of the things that we've done for our customers is looking at um, what we can do to keep their employees healthy and safe. And before the silica sands, that was a, the big buzzword, we had developed a water mist system that could be used on the uh, job site and, as a dust, uh, reliable dust suppression system. We also, um, our only track drills that we build are electric hydraulic, um, and they're designed to safely and quietly install micropiles. So there's no emissions within the buildings because of the, um, their electric hydraulic. The TEI electric hydraulic drills are the single units only require an outside electrical source, reduces noise, fumes, and removes the need for bulky hydraulic hoses throughout the drilling area, which actually is safer for your employees. Um, we started in 1980. Um, our company started as an engineering consulting firm. Um, Bill Patterson, our founder, um, worked with the US Bureau of Mines to research um, noise control in mining. At that time, most of the drifters that were used within the industry were pneumatic, um, and we developed some of the first hydraulic drifters and hydraulic attachments, which reduced the decibel rating by 30%. Um, the, I think one of our, our biggest challenges right now um, in sustainability is um, finding employees and, and people that are interested in what would have been termed as a blue collar industry. Um, so we continue um, to support our employees with uh, additional training and education. Um, and we have, we, we very much believe in the apprenticeship program. Um, the majority of our employees that started at TEI and we've got employees that have been here for 20 years um, started with uh, no real training within uh, their job, whether it be welding or machining or hydraulic mechanics. And we tend to start um, our employees at an apprentice level and then work them up through. And many of those apprentices are now managers within our system. We also believe strongly in supporting our community and we keep our giving dollars within our community. The 90% of our giving dollars are kept within our, our community. And um, we choose what we give to you by how it will affect our employees' quality of life and um, services that they might use um, as, as, they, as they age or become uh, any, any medical issues that they might have. And then honestly, just supporting the arts in the growing and keeping that within our community as well. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Um, I would um, ask now all the, uh, the panelists to, uh, to turn on their webcam because in the next hour, uh, what we are gonna do is have a, a discussion uh, with, with everybody here uh, about the topic of sustainability. And for the attendees, once again, if you have any questions that you would like to, to ask, uh, please use the, uh, the question uh, box, and then at least I will uh, put those questions uh, to, to the panelists. But before we, we get to, to those questions, um, one question I have for all of you is that obviously you are heading up uh, an organization, large or small, uh, but you are convinced that sustainability makes, makes sense. How about your employees? Are they on board? What, what, did, what did it take to, to get your employees on board? And did it actually help you in your organization to attract people uh, because you are being seen as, as a more sustainable uh, company? Anybody who would like to start first? I can start. Seth. I think uh, on the engineering side, the convincing is pretty easy. Um, if you ask, if you challenge people and ask them, to think about the efficiency of their work and to make you know, leaner, meaner designs. 
that's fun, right? And it's easy to communicate that with the clients that understand it. Uh, perhaps one of the running jokes I have with my boss though is uh, these pickup trucks, right? He, he, he's coming from overseas and he hates pickup trucks. And we explain to him that's American culture, <laughs> but uh, we, we've created some programs for the guys that, for the people that get company vehicles that have some allowance, we've created an allowance program where you get so much a month to drive whatever thing you want that uses whatever gas it uses. You get an extra $150 if you take uh, a hybrid car that gets around 35 miles per gallon or more. And if you take a full electric, you get an extra $300 a month. And some people have taken us up on that. And so it just starts, it's just, you know, a little bit of incentive helps, but also, and, and people do believe it. Um, on the pickup truck side, we're just gonna have to wait. You know, we're gonna start ordering hybrids and, or even direct electrics once there's enough places to charge them. And that's, uh, and we'll see, you know, but we, have, we do have a culture in this country where people like to drive big vehicles and burn a lot of fuel. <laughs> it's something that'll take some time. Okay. Eric, what what's your views uh, about uh, the employees? Uh, how yeah, hard was it to get them on board? Yeah, I mean, frankly, the, the reactions have been mixed. You know, some things like sort of learning the, the BFI carbon calculator, that's added work, right? On the other hand, and especially amongst, you know, younger employees, you know, sustainability is kind of an exciting and, and noble challenge. Um, you know, the, the social side or people side of it, you know, we've had really great response with some of our affinity groups, you know, namely, and the most advanced in our company is, is Quick, our Keller Women in Construction. Um, and that is that has grown tremendously. We had uh, last fall, uh, uh, you know, an all well, an all project manager uh, company internal company conference, and uh, the, the the women in our company were were a, a decided force, uh, more so than you know we've been having these things for several decades, and uh, the women in our, amongst our ranks are are really uh, uh, really players within our company. We're happy to see that. Okay. Sue, so, what about say, your organization? Since you're doing a lot of outreach and you emphasize that, I'm sure your employees really um, appreciate that. But how was it in, in general to, to get people on board with the sustainability effort? Um, I think for us, it's a little bit easier because the things that you're doing honestly directly affect them. So, you know, just things like, um, even with our welders, like we have recirculating welding masks now so that they're even more protected um, from anything that they might be inhaling as they're, as they're manufacturing. So it, it was easier to get on board, but I do notice when we are interviewing um, the younger generation, they wanna know what we're doing and they wanna, and, and when you're designing equipment, like. They want to be a part of it, and they want to they want to know what impact they're going to have within the society as a whole, and then within the industry that they're working in. That that does seem much more important. Right, Victor. Yeah, it it I was surprised when we uh, started embracing sustainability more formally as a company that um, uh, the reaction was, as you can imagine, is was generally generational. Um, the staff we had that were sort of born in the 70s and after really embraced it. And in, in many respects, they would they told me, though, this is why I got into engineering. I, I wanted to build things and design things that are, you know, better for society and that are uh, not impact adversely impacting the environment. And, and some of the skeptics, I think, were, were easily swayed once you once you've been through one of these sustainability framework processes on a project. And they see that actually it, it doesn't add cost to the project. It doesn't need to add cost to the project. And in many cases, we're we're trying to figure out ways to save money. Um, and 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 that was a that was sort of won over some of the crowd that were skeptical about it uh, as well. Okay, Gerald, if I if I could add one other comment, sure. Uh, at the Vinci level, for years we've had innovation contests. These are global contests. They're run regionally in different groups of countries, and then the winners from those countries go to the finals in France. Uh, so 
This year, the innovation was changed to sustainability innovation. And there are hundreds of entries of this thing. And we have judging panels and all kinds of things. That we, and so it really, really gets people engaged in, uh, in coming up with innovative ideas to help solve this problem because it's not that easy. And we, we had two different teams from the US of young engineers that made it to the made prizes in the US and they were judged in France but didn't win any global prizes but still these once people win these prizes then we have programs to help disseminate them and get them used and we've been doing that on the innovation side but now on this sustainability innovation and it's so it really really engages everybody across all levels of the company it's, okay it's pretty powerful uh, a few questions from uh, from the audience. Um, one for for Sue. Uh, how much more expensive are the electric drills compared to conventional drills? Um, they're not. I like that. They're very comparable. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> And that, that again, it, it, it emphasizes this concept that uh, some of you have already mentioned, that people think that when you do things sustainable, uh, it adds to cost. And in most cases, it's not. Or actually, as Seth and uh, I think Eric mentioned as well, it, it actually saves money. Uh, and then a question that came in for Eric and Seth, uh, considering the CO2 reduction in ground improvement, and more specifically uh, for cement, are the contractors willing to pay a little bit more to novel binders and or specific additives without losing performance? Yeah, let me, well, so I think the state of sustainability in North America, generally speaking, you know, no, but it's coming. Certainly in Europe, owners and contractors are willing to pay more for sustainable solutions. I also think it's important and maybe not for, for contractors, but certainly for owners to understand that you know, it certainly starts with the structural design process. So for instance, you know, in the seismic zone, you know, ground improvement solutions can, can change the seismic site classification, which allows the superstructure to be much more sustainable or much, much lower carbon. Whereas the foundation solution might be say soil mixing, which is associated with, you know, large amounts of cement, uh, but there can be huge gains in the superstructure if the project is kind of looked at as a whole, starting with structural design. Okay. Seth, any things that you'd like to add there? Yeah, I mean, nobody's gonna willingly pay more money for a material that makes the job more expensive necessarily. But if that material is innovative enough that it allows you to use less, then of course you would. For example, if I can cut the amount of concrete in half by adding seven tenths of a percent of a high grade steel fiber and lower the, so the fibers cost a lot of money, but I'm using half the amount of concrete. Of course, you know, the, the money always, the money will always follow the, the carbon calculation. It has to. Um, on the other side of that, you know, it, it's certainly, it's no secret that in big, large, flat buildings, you know, ground improvement has revolutionized the way they got built. If you go roll back 20 years and you put them on piles with 12 inch thick, doubly reinforced floors, you didn't need as many piles. There was a lot of carbon in those big, thick structural floors. And now people are using thin floors and ground improvement. It's changed the way we build these big flat buildings. And, and it has, but it was, it didn't, they didn't do it because it was greener. They did it because it was cheaper. Right. <laughs> Let's be real. People, the dollars have to work out, but people are not going to do it. Absolutely. That, that's an interesting thing, too, because we had a similar experience, um, you know, as as we've grown and developed our manufacturing facility, you know, you had an existing building um, and it did not have a, a very thick concrete floor on it. So we were actually having issues with movement within the equipment as we started to put larger and larger machinery in there. And we were able to resolve it by putting we every every machining center that we have out there is set on micro piles instead of having to redo that entire concrete floor. Okay, uh, a question for uh, for Victor uh, that came in. Can you please share an example as to how sustainable solutions uh, would help manage risk on projects? In addition, can you please elaborate on uh, sustainable rating schemes? 
Right. So um, I'll just use Envision as an example. Uh, the way uh, Envision, uh, which is a sustainability framework, the way in, uh, for linear infrastructure and most of what we're involved with is linear infrastructure. Um, what in the approach that Envision takes um, is, you know, very similar to a risk, you know, a, a, a risk management approach, which is, you know, assessing the impact, you know, of a, of a material or energy use, uh, and then looking at ways to mitigate it. Uh, so it, it, it very much follows a, a risk management approach that we're all used to anyways uh, on, on heavy civil projects, because, you know, we, we we're involved with projects that often have big, you know, big risk issues, and we need to address those for our clients. So, um, yeah, that, that's how it's approached. Now, um, if the question is about what are the different frameworks, um, you know, there's about, you know, three or four in use. We're, we primarily uh, in North America are using Envision uh, and in Australia and New Zealand using ISCA. Um, ISCA is very, very, um, very rigorous, actually, probably more, a little more rigorous than Envision. Uh, but I, I quite like Envision because it's it's um, it's user friendly um, clients. It's easy to explain to clients and understand it. And it, like I said, it's like a risk. It's a it's a risk. It's kind of a risk similar to a risk based approach that clients understand. Um, and we do use, you know, lead was sort of one of the first uh, uh, um, uh, sustainability frameworks. And we still do use that. But, you know, that's really designed for vertical construction. And most of what we're involved with is horizontal construction. That's really why kind of. Envision was created, and that's what ISCA in Australia and New Zealand that it, it recognizes the the you know or it builds a, a measurement a, a, a sustainability measurement system around linear infrastructure. Okay. Um, after these more specific questions, let, let's take a step back again. And we started out saying, okay, your views on sustainability. Uh, we then talked a little bit about uh, how the employees got on board. But a lot of people then say, well, yeah, that, that's all fine, good and dandy. You talk a lot about it. Uh, you, you make people feel good about this whole thing. But how do you measure that you are making a difference? How do you measure your sustainable efforts? What, what kind of metrics are you using? Uh, Seth, you already put some of that in your presentation. So let me start uh, with you to answer that, that question. But what specific things are you doing within your organization to, to measure that? And then we'll go around the table. Well, it, it's very hard. So these numbers that we came up with was a, a global survey uh, of the amount of yards of concrete or grout that we buy. Uh, that we were trying to look for the big picture items, the, the amount of fuel that we're burning every year, we're trying to just baseline on some simple things that we can measure. We didn't survey what everybody's electric bill is in their office or whether they decided to put solar panels on their office. We didn't bring it down to that level of detail but you have to sort of hit the big ones and stick with those and be consistent in the way that you baseline year on year on year. Otherwise, because the purpose of doing this is not to measure, the purpose of doing this is to reduce, is to reduce and make things more efficient and make things have less carbon. So we have to do the exercise, but it's not what everybody dwells their time on in our business. It's about changing the business and the, and the measurement will work itself out. Okay, Victor, how, how would you uh, address it? Uh, what, what are you doing to, to measure what, what you're doing and the effectiveness of what you're doing? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll say that, answer that in two parts of how we're approaching it. I said in my presentation, one of the things we're doing is we're trying to be more sustainable in our business operations um, before, before I get to the part about projects and clients. And so what we did is we implemented for our business operations in our offices like a, a baseline uh, survey when we started on this, um, when we, you know, enacted a sustainability framework for the entire company. And so all that, all that, it was basically an audit of our operations in each offices. And all that was, is just to uh, look, you know, it's just a structured way to look at ways to improve sustainability in our operations, whether that's our use of materials and energy in our offices or um, vendors we use, outside vendors and that sort of thing. So, um, and that just got, and, and, and does that have a huge impact? Um, it does, you know, it has an impact as far as our operations, but, you know, like I said, we're a 500 person firm, but it gets staff thinking along those lines. So then when we get to the part of, of how do we measure it on projects, you know, I mentioned the frameworks 
uh, just a minute ago, I mentioned the frameworks that clients are asking us to use or that we're recommending clients are using. And, you know, our clients, you know, which are generally owners, um, owners of infrastructure, they want measurable outcomes so they can demonstrate within their organization and to their rate payers, you know, or the public that, that they're achieving sustainable outcomes. So, you know, using these, um, these sustainability frameworks provides you with a way to measure both qualitative and qual quad quantitative um, sustainable outcomes. And again, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's a way to show that you're, you're striving to make improvements, you know, when you're either in the design phase of a project or during construction, you know, to hold uh, the contractors accountable to sustainable, you know, the sustainable goals that, that, that the owners have. And, and when the contractor embraces sustainability, that, that accountability gets very, it's very easy. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Sue, what, what about your organization? How do you measure your, your, your efforts? Um, I don't know if we have a good way to give like exact numbers of what we're, how we're impacting the environment. But just each year we look at, you know, are there different ways that we can um, change our practices that will that will change any impact that we're having around us? Um, you know, behind us is a large city park, and being and being a manufacturer here, we're very very aware of the the amount of noise that we're making, and. Um, we certainly don't want to release anything into the environment that could impact anything down there. And we have a large rip, um, uh, water park as well, right down there. So those sorts of things. And then I would say with, um, just with our employees, it's the, you know, the longevity that, the, that they've been with us just proves that the practices that we're putting in place um, to, protect them has made an impact. So you really feel that what you're doing is helping you retain uh, employees, which of course in, in this day and age where uh, getting staff is, is harder and harder uh, is, is a major uh, step forward and uh, very helpful. Yes, 100%. Okay. Eric, uh, how, how do you measure uh, the, uh, the the efforts uh, within, uh, within Keller? Yeah, well, you know, the in time, the quick and easy answer is, is when we feel we've differentiated our company and we're making money because of it. You know, but we do have very defined corporate targets regarding uh, carbon emissions. And we allow them to uh, uh, define our progress pretty clearly in this area. You know, right now, current targets are for scope one and two emissions, right? Uh, which is, you know, fuel and electricity. On the social side, it's a bit harder to measure but we do things like employee engagement surveys um, and we look at our ability to recruit and retain diverse talent. Um, so those are some of the key metrics that we're looking on in the early days of this movement to, to measure our progress and success. Well, you say early days. Uh, Seth brought up, of course, the, the article or the interview that he uh, gave in, uh, in 2008, uh, so uh, 14 years ago. Uh, and a skeptic might say, what has really changed? Uh, what, what, what we knew then and what, we knew, what we're doing now, is, have we really made a lot of progress other than that there are now more specific targets within companies? Looking back at your own organization, uh, would you say that it's night and day uh, between where we were, say, 10, 15 years ago and now? Or is it more... Well, between dusk and, and daylight or something like that. How, how would you characterize it? And Sue, let me, let me start with you, if I may. Um, I, th I think definitely as a, as a machinery manufacturer, there's been a definite uptick in what is required of us that we're um, in the equipment that we're putting out, I mean, obviously the tier four engines and things like that is going to affect everybody quite significantly. Um, but even just having to deal with the silica sands and how are you going to keep job sites safe for our employees? 
Um, it's something as simple as a tooling handler. Um, you know, they used to move those big pipes around with just a winch and that's not acceptable anymore. So they're looking for ways that you can move move um, tooling around job sites that keeps the employees safer. And it's just a requirement anymore that, that you have to constantly, constantly be looking at that. Okay. Victor, how would you characterize the improvements we've made over the last, uh, say, 10, 15 years? Oh, well, you know, just by the use of these frameworks has made a great improvement, uh, not because of the frameworks themselves, but they've driven a process of innovation. Um, so when, you know, like I was saying in, in my presentation, when you're asked to conserve materials or reduce energy and whether that's an energy reduction during construction or an energy reduction on the whole life of the project, it drives you to innovative solutions and innovation drives progress on projects and improvements on, project, on, pro, on projects. And um, yeah, we've just seen new technologies and new ways of using materials and better ways of using materials and smarter ways of using materials instead of, um, you know, and a, a lot of it is, is related to you know reuse and recycling as well. Um, you know materials that were once waste are no longer considered waste anymore, and they're they're um, incorporated into the project uh, a second time. Right, Eric. Yeah, I mean, I, when I when I say kind of early days, um, I think it's an it's an awareness thing, right? And certainly in North America, I mean, I, frankly. You know, sustainability really only hit my personal radar in my business dealings over the past three years. Um, you know, I think Victor put it correctly in his uh, opening that the hallmark of good engineering is to, you know, reduce, uh, to make it more eloquent designs, which are more, more efficient, right? We feel that uh, our company, as a SaaS company involved in ground improvement, sort of the, the originators of, of sustainable solutions in the foundation industry. Um, so it's just the idea of the awareness and the tools for tracking that, that to me make this sort of early days and new, but you know, the concepts of efficiency, again, have always been part of what we do and what we're about. Okay. So let me rephrase that question for you slightly. Um, you gave that interview in 2008. Are there any statements that you made then that you would not make today or where you can clearly see this is a, a way would respond to that question uh, based on the situation today completely differently or is by and large what you said in that article, because I'm sure people are going to ask me after this, this webinar to, to share that article, which I, I definitely will. But are there things that you would address completely differently? Oh, now you're catching me off guard. Okay. <laughs> While you think so, about it, I'm gonna. Well, uh, yeah, I, I wanted to add for a second though about what Eric said. Okay. In terms of in terms of what's changed, it was that since I looked back at that 2008, I also started thinking back at a conversation I had when I was still working at Nicholson, and soil mixing was just coming into the market, and we we're trying to figure out where it could be used and where it made sense to use. And Jerry DiMaggio was. I had a conversation with Jerry and he was still working at the FHWA. And I said, what about soil mixing for something like this? And he said, why would you ever put cement in the ground if you can just shake it up and put some stone in it? So, and that wasn't, and maybe that wasn't driven by innovation, by sustainability, but it was certainly driven by dollars, right? If you need the cement, you spend it, but if you don't, then you don't, right? And Menard, the company was founded by Louis Menard and, and he started out by just pounding on the ground. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get much simpler. You burn some fuel, but you don't have any other added materials. And, and so we, and as we developed things, obviously soil mixing took off. It's a very large process. We, we changed the stone column market and put in these concrete based elements, these rigid inclusions, CMCs. And in fact, then some of these techniques because they were driven by dollars and efficiency, maybe are a little less sustainable. So if anything, now we're working to re-efficient, make what was once more efficient. We're, we're trying to improve the efficiency of the things we're currently doing. Mm -hmm. Whether that's, whether it's mixing or putting inclusions in or putting stone on the ground, we, we still have to look at that and we want to compare it 
against other things that you might try to do. And, and, the, and as I said earlier, the low fruit may not be in what we do, but it may be in the structural design. And I really appreciate what Victor said uh, about the ethics of over-design on your client's behalf. And in fact, that's unethical to waste your client's money and to waste resources and to waste money and to waste material. So, but many engineers today are reluctant to do what they perceive as pushing the limit or making a lean design. But when you do that inside the parameters of the building codes and you're just interpreting them in a more creative way and you're still coming up with a lean design and you can prove that it works, why would you not do it? Mm -hmm. So I think there are a lot of people that are complacent with designs that are just too, too fat. Okay. They're not willing to think they're in too much of a hurry. They have limited budgets, limited time. Right. Uh, a question that came in from uh, the audience and I would word it slightly different, but uh, in your, your companies, have you included key performance indicators for as part of the, the staff appraisal uh, of your for your management team uh, in your uh, decision regarding uh, salary increases uh, that uh, that relate to, to sustainability? Anybody who has that in, in their companies, uh, just a clear yes or no? Yeah, we, we, you know, measure on our dashboards, uh, you know, our, our uh, reduction in scope one and two uh, emissions targets. Uh, we also have, you know, with regard to bonus and compensation, uh, uh, you know, re requirements to offer on certain types and sizes of projects, uh, a carbon calculation uh, so that owners can start to see uh, these things, whether they're interested or not. We're trying to raise the level of awareness uh, and the fact that we can provide those things for them. Okay. So, yeah, that's pretty, yeah, sorry. What's that going? That's pretty good. I mean, I, I can't say that we're openly offering that carbon calculation at this stage, but of course, as I said, we're, we're baselining what we're doing as a company that then gets consolidated at the at the bigger level. So every of the, the thousands of companies that Vinci's operating, everybody's baselining, trying to use the same consistent approach. Okay, Victor? Oh, I would say like how it relates to employees and, and compensation and that sort of thing. It, it's, um, it's just now viewed that um, understanding sustainability, it's another part of the, your skill. It's another part of your skill set. Just like some engineers, like it's just like it's important for some, not all, but for some engineers in our organization to get professional licensure, where you know if uh, they may be expected to get um, sustainability certification or at least have uh, knowledge of sustainability implementation as part of their job. So it's just another thing you have to do now in an engineer. So it's just sort of built into the career development now. Mm -hmm. It's an expectation. Yeah. Right. Sue, anything that you would like to add? Um, I mean, we reward on efficiencies and, um, of course, re reduction in scrap. But that doesn't mean just that they're not re they're not um, scrapping the part in process. But you know, how can we um, more efficiently use the materials that we buy in? Okay. Uh, another question that came in, and again, it, it ties in with what some of you already said. Uh, Eric, a few min uh, minutes ago, mentioned. Uh, using a calorie calculator, give it to the clients whether they want it or not. Uh, Seth mentioned earlier uh, about uh, completely recycling uh, the uh, the asphalt, uh, but a lot of DOTs are reluctant about it. Um, that ties in with the question that came in. It's as companies that are convinced that sustainability makes sense, what can we do as an industry? to get owners more on board with the, this whole concept, that they start writing in their specifications uh, an approach that allows you to be more sustainable uh, and possibly even uh, promote uh, more sustainable approaches. Um, Seth or Eric, uh, any views on, on that? You know, it's gonna be hard to, to bring owners around. I mean, it, it still is certainly in North America very much dollars and cents. Sustainable solutions that are lower cost, yeah, that's a pretty easy sell. But to choose sustainability uh, over cost is more difficult. We are seeing industries, though, you know, the tech industry, you know, the, the Googles and Amazons, 
who who truly do seem to have a mission to uh, to pay more money to get more sustainability. Um, and I think you know that energizes in general you know younger younger people, and it's catching on. So you know what can we do to 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 convince owners? I mean, those are the things that'll be slowly to get along. I think engineers need to adopt a, a significant additional skill set to accommodate the variable of embodied carbon in structures, right? Because like I said before, just calculating carbon in a foundation solution is really the tip of the iceberg. And if a project as a structure is looked at as a whole, there's probably much greater opportunities for overall reduction in, uh, in superstructure. Mm -hmm. Right, I, I, I agree 100%. I mean, so first of all, we looked at that article and I wouldn't say anything different and I'll probably keep saying that even when I retire. That's kind of my mission <laughs> in life is that sort of message. Uh, but it, this issue of educating the clients, um, there is another, you know, besides the Googles and the Amazons, there's another company out of Pittsburgh, a big bank called PNC. They own three or four major landmark structures in town, some high rise, some mid rise. The latest one they built is one of the greenest buildings on the planet. It's a lead platinum building. They're, they're fully, all their buildings are lead gold or lead platinum. They're fully committed as a company to do this. And I don't know what got them started on it. They've been doing it for quite a long time, but people do have the willingness to do that. And it's not glamorous or fashionable to say you put up a structure and you wasted a lot of carbon to do it. I mean, I don't see the benefit in that, but the degree of acceptance is still a variable, right? Um, you know, when I was reviewing all the stuff that Vinci's doing, we have one division that develops apartment complexes in, in France. We're, we're a big, you know, we're basically, we're, we're a developer. And they're committed within the next couple of years to never take another project that is not on recycled land. So they, they don't want to take any more farmland, take any more green land. They're doing everything on brownfields. And many, uh, in many markets, like in New Jersey, for example, go try to build a big facility in the middle of a farm where the land might be a little simpler to build on. You're not going to get the permits. You try to go onto a brownfield and there's all kinds of legislative incentives to redo these brownfields. So we can influence it politically. And there is a reason to want to you know, fix up the brownfields and put new facilities on those. In terms of clients, again, I think the simplest sell is in the dollars. If we can innovate things that are greener and it's also cheaper, they'll have no problem with it. But it also means being willing to use some more innovative materials. You know, people say, why should I add $60 for steel fibers to a yard of concrete? Well, what if I could use half the concrete? So it's, but that kind of thinking needs to be, you have to educate the clients. So it's in the structural engineers, the geos, the, the owners, everybody. So from an equipment manufacturer point of view, how, how do you see uh, what we can do to, to get owners uh, be more uh, open, more interested in the more sustainable solutions? Do you, do you see that efforts are required in that area? Or do you say, nah, we're, we're, we're there? Well, certainly, I think in just making more aware um, <clears throat> the long-term savings, I think, um, bringing, bringing that to the forefront, just as Seth said, it's like, well, yes, you're paying more for the, the fibers, but you're paying less in concrete. So it really, you're doing, it, it washes. And I think um, just looking at um, like the geothermal or the, or solar is not as practical, but we do like a passive solar because we're in Colorado in our building. So when we, you know, if we do add on or we build um, a different um, shop or do different manufacturing, um, we look at all of the, those sorts of things. And, and then of course, as I said, we're gonna, we're gonna look at how, what the emissions that we're putting out as a manufacturer and how we can reduce those always. Okay. Victor, anything that you would like to add there? 
Oh, I, I, I think it's been well said. <laughs> okay. Well, let me from uh, to you with another question that came in. Um, as a uh, head of an engineering firm, what what do you think is required to get engineers to start thinking in more sustainable approaches? Because that means uh, promoting innovation, doing things differently than before. Do you have found, or have you found a uh, the, the the, the approach to, to make that happen? Have you figured out how to, to drive more to start implementing more innovative techniques to make things more sustainable? Can you share anything with, uh, with the attendees? Well, it's easier to do when the clients embrace it and ask you as, as their designer to embrace it. So then it, it becomes a, a project requirement, right? Um, and one of the things I, one of the ways that when, when it first started you know, becoming, uh, when we first started seeing owners, and, and this is primarily in the coastal region of the, of the USA, require it, uh, it was a new thing for us. And oftentimes we'd have to rely on another consultant uh, to, to help us implement, you know, measure and implement sustainability. Um, but as we went through those processes, we thought, well, we're, it's better if we know how to do these things and we're able to, to provide the services ourselves to our clients. And instead of treating it like a, like a, like a specialty sub consultant that comes in and helps us to find sustainability and measure it. Um, we should be doing it in our day-to-day, -day, um, uh, our day-to-day -day work as designers. Um, and, and the, the, you, you achieve, you know, better outcomes as well, you know, and I guess another way of looking at it is um, you achieve the best outcomes on sustainability when you implement this process er very early um, during the planning stage or the preliminary design stage. And I, I don't, I, I, I cringe when some owners just kick the sustainability can down the road to the contractors and just say, you know, just let's just put in spec requirements that they have to, you know, you know, reuse materials and reduce and reduce energy and all that stuff. You know, I mean, those are, those are, those are good things to implement, but the project, the concept of the project and the overall design of the project needs to be sustainable before it's, we ask a contractor to build it. Um, and it's, it's a better outcome if the sustainability is already built into the design rather than just, just you know, kicking the can down the road. So I guess the, the motivation there is, um, uh, you know, it, it's part of the engineering, it should be part of the engineering process now. Uh, and if, if we don't do it uh, a good job of it, our competitors will do it better than us mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll get more work than we will. Right. Um, Gerald, I, I'd like I'd like to argue that people have been doing a lot of things that are sustainable for quite a while, and maybe driven by the economics of it, maybe not. But you know, things like fly ash and concrete and slag and concrete—it's been around for quite a long time, to the point where now it's it's actually running scarce. Mm -hmm. and so you want to save Portland, but you can't get slag or fly ash in a lot of markets. So we have to ask the cement industry and the people who do research in concrete materials, what is the next big thing? Can we use other waste materials? What is the next slag? What is the next fly ash? Because there's a, you know, we're gonna burn less coal, but the fly ash is gonna run out. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's a challenge. There are mountains of fly ash laying in valleys that were disposed of for other reasons. So the good fly ash is the stuff that's coming off dry the stuff that's wet laying inside these mountains. Is there any way we can figure out how to use that stuff? Mm -hmm. So there are some challenges yet to be undertaken uh, that I'm not clear about how we solve them. Right, well, that's the, the thinking that we have to do. Uh, coming back to something that I said earlier, there's a question there. Uh, I mentioned that you as heads of your organization are committed to, to sustainability. We talked about uh, what uh, would it take uh, or how your, your staff is dealing with that. A question that came up with, what kind of training do you provide in your organization uh, to, to promote sustainability? And what kind of training do you think is most successful? Is it presentations by yourself to your, to your staff? Is it bringing an outside consultant? Is it show, sharing success stories? What, what is the, the most effective way that a company that is not as aggressive on, on sustainability like, like yours uh, are, 
how can they implement and then train their staff in the most efficient ways based on your experiences? Eric, let's start with you. Sure, we do we do a lot of things, right? It's a multi-pronged approach. I mean, first, first and foremost, you know, we we maintain on staff uh, two PhD level uh, engineers who are actually experts in sustainability. And uh, they beat the drum for our company and uh, are actively engaged in all aspects, whether it's uh, meeting with the potential suppliers to come up with uh, uh, or to, to help fund pretty exciting uh, solutions for alternatives to, uh, to cement and aggregates, um, to also promoting our social agenda. You know, we, we have to be careful in this conversation not to always keep coming back to carbon because sustainability is, is so much more, right? Fair wages, clean water, life on land, um, economic uh, opportunity, you know, all those things you know, fall under this large sustainability umbrella. So there's uh, uh, plenty of plenty of ways to uh, to promote to promote that, and it 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 hopefully ends up with a motivated and engaged workforce um, to help drive our future. Right. And okay. I am old enough now to to look back and think that uh, when I do have grandchildren, I have two adult children right now and no grandchildren yet. I do want them to inherit uh, a planet that uh, that they can enjoy the things that I've been able to. Right. Well, as a grandfather myself, I can fully share it. And also you mentioned uh, your PhD uh, uh, employees. Uh, I have to mention one of them, Kimberly Martin, who is a member of the uh, DFI Sustainability Committee, who is really doing an awful lot in, in our committee. And I definitely uh, appreciate her, her efforts. Uh, Seth, training, what, what kind of training is this most effective in your views uh, to get your staff on board with sustainability? Uh, well, as I said, you know, we're promoting this internal philosophy of less is more Menard, you know, convincing people that you want to get leaner. I think the best engagement tool that we have is this, is this uh, annual competition thing. Mm -hmm. To, to come up with ideas across, I mean, you, I, so I, I got a chance to make little videos because we, we did them remotely this year. So I made some little videos presenting certain people, certain awards that had been judged to be the winners of North America. And it engaged people across all lines, not just, not just engineers, but the one, one that I presented was to a person, a lady who's running an office, a pretty big office for one of the asphalt companies in the South. And she greened up her office and saved, you know, 40% on the energy use of the office. And another prize was given to some guys at an asphalt plant in Maine, and they built some new tanks and they did some special insulation projects and they did a whole bunch of energy studies and they really reduced the amount of energy they were using at this asphalt plant. And that stuff was submitted under the, to win prizes. So it, it's training the people that do the research to figure out how to solve a specific problem and at the same time, it's educating everyone else in the company because we all get on a we all get on a call and listen to the awards being presented, and it's so it really, really promotes the spirit of that and gets people thinking about it. Uh, yeah, one one of the guys took it apart. We've been using recycled concrete for years in the Northeast, but in the South, it's a little different problem. And one of the guys started looking at the cost of. Uh, the aggregates that were coming into the Gulf because they're coming from Mexico and he calculated the carbon it took to you know, mine it there and bring it on barges and what it was costing and how much carbon that would generate if we needed to lay down aggregate in the Gulf. And he found a source of recycled concrete there and then showed the savings. So in one place where a material is common in the North, it was not yet common in that market. And he won a North American prize for that effort, right? So, while I don't, I can't cite specific formal training stuff that we have. This, you know, asking people to solve creative problems that you don't know the answers to is a form of training. Okay, Victor, anything that you'd like to add there? Yeah. So in our company strategic plan, we have a, a, three sustainability goals, and one of those sustainability goals is training. So uh, one of the subset goals was we wanted to get. Um, uh, sustainable certification across the company geographically. And once we achieved that, then we said we wanted those individuals 
to be the champions and push out training to the rest of the company. So we, we target um, four um, internal trainings a year on sustainability, you know, on, you know, how to, how to implement it on projects or what we're doing internally with our business operations. And so to, uh, half of those trainings are done by internally by our, that those individual inter, uh, they're given by individuals within our organization, two of those four trainings. And the other two trainings is we invite somebody from the outside uh, to give us their uh, perspective on, you know, or, or, or uh, demonstrate a new, technology or process that they're implementing on, on sustainability. So, you know, we have, we have formal defined goals on, on that training within our organization. And, and I, and I guess I would say lastly, beyond those four trainings, whenever we get a supplier or a vendor or a specialty subcontractor who wants to talk to us about um, a new, you know, new materials or construction methods that have sustainability aspects, we always say yes to have them come in and, and educate our staff. Okay. Sue, anything else you'd like to add? I was thinking, um, I don't know if I have a lot to add, but one of the things that we did add within um, our, um, like, medical insurance and, and coverages within that was when you were talking about mental health um, and it and it really kicked in within we added it um, three years ago but it was a services for um, just counseling legal counseling and financial counseling and it was it was pretty amazing how many of our um, employees used it and how helpful those things ended up being for them. Okay. One, one short question on the, that same front. As I've been thinking about sustainability and how to implement sustainability in companies and what, what things we can do in the sustainability committee, I drew a lot of parallels with uh, the, the safety efforts back in, in the 1970s uh, as companies were, were pushed to get implement more effective safety programs or in the 1980s, uh, the, the quality program, the total quality management, and so on. And one of the things that you start seeing was that uh, in, in meetings, we would have a safety moment at the beginning of every meeting, uh, whether we were doing anything on a job site or sitting in an engineering office, there had to be a safety moment. Would it make sense to have a sustainability moment? Um, is that something that, that would help promote sustainability? Any, any response to, to that? I've been on some design build projects and, you know, that I would say it wasn't a, a sustainability moment at every meeting, but um, in our fortnightly meetings, you know, the, the, you know, somebody was some, somebody was asked to present very, very briefly. Oh, you know, what was a, what was a sustainability uh, method you implemented either in the design or in the construction methodology, uh, you know, within the design build team. Um, but of course, that was driven because the owner required it, you know, as part of a project. So that that, that had to start that that, that the, the value had to start at the owner level so that it, it was it flowed down into the design build team. But but, yeah, I've, I've seen that done, you know, what, what, you know, share your sustainability outcome to the rest of the team. OK. Yeah. Any others that would like to add something on that? Yeah. Well, don't you know, don't forget. Um, the safety moment, which which we do quite often, uh, is in fact sustainability, right? Mm -hmm. Keeping keeping people safe, health and wellness. Yeah. Um, it is in our industry about keeping people safe on construction sites, and I don't see replacing the safety moment with a broader sustainability moment. Sustainability, you know, we we will bring about through uh, constant dialogue in meetings and setting targets both internally and externally. But to directly answer your question, I don't see having a separate sustainability moment at uh, you know the, the opening of every meeting, for example. And we do that for safety specifically. Okay. Yeah, yeah Gerald. Sure. Uh, yeah, we, we do a weekly all company safety call where we discuss all the catches that have been called out, things that people find and fix. So they, that can be disseminated well. 
There's always a quality moment discussed in there as well. Somebody discovered a quality issue and shows how they fixed it and how they discovered it. Uh, it certainly would make sense, maybe not every week, but to if people have an idea about a, a way to improve a practice to create less use of materials and resources, that, that we would have a way of collecting those ideas. If anything, just so we can help them enter the international contest, but also implement them if, if, we, can, if we can. So right. you're right. And, it, it's not something you start necessarily, I'd start every meeting with, but it is something we can add to our suite of mechanisms that we use to collect people's good practice and disseminate and share those practices. Yeah. So in your organization, as being a small organization, probably it's easier if somebody has a sustainable idea to just walk into your office <laughs> and, uh, or catch you at uh, the the coffee machine. Uh, yeah. but anything you would like to add there? Um, you know, we have, we have a we have like a safety committee that that has a representative from each department that meets monthly, and then we we do do a company wide safety meeting um, every month. And certainly things can be brought up there. Um, and then we we just we do encourage everybody to. Um, for us, it's talking about how can how can we work more efficiently. Um, but in the end, as you're doing that, you know, you're, you're saving personal energy and the energy that you're using within right. the manufacturing process. So, yeah, we're coming close to uh, the end of, of this webinar. Uh, the fact that there were more than 150 people that actually uh, signed in today shows that there's definitely interest uh, in, in this topic. Uh, also, I've never been at a DFI uh, webinar where there were this many questions from, from the audience, so that, that was good. Uh, but let me close with uh, asking all four of you to answer uh, one final question uh, in one short sentence. Uh, not, not a long, but uh, to the point. Uh, what would you say to other executives of, of American companies regarding the need of implementing actions to make their companies' activities more sustainable? What is your uh, strong advice uh, in, in one or maybe two sentences? Uh, Sue, let, let's start with you. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> um, well, let, we'll let you think about it. Victor, let's start with you. Okay, I don't want to sound negative, but I, I'll say embrace it or get left behind, um, either because clients are are increasingly asking for it or your employee or your your younger employees are increasingly asking for it and you know do it in a way that improves projects okay eric i agree with victor but i'll make it uh, a little more concise start now okay start now and otherwise you're left behind uh seth i, I agree with both of them and i, I would say it even simpler the simpler is if you don't start now, then your company won't be sustainable. You'll likely be out of business in 10 years. Okay. Sue, any? Uh, yeah, I was thinking our tagline for the year is building our future together. And that's what it's about, working together. Okay. Okay. Uh, I want to thank you very much for, for participating in this. Uh, this was a, a new effort within DFI. Uh, the fact that uh, we had initially more than 300 people sign up uh, that about 50% of them actually uh, signed in for, for this webinar uh, is, is a good sign that uh, we at least there's interest in, in this topic. And as a sustainability committee, we're very grateful that you were willing to participate in this, this panel discussion. And hopefully we, we have shared some, some useful ideas with, uh, with the attendees. Uh, for those of you that are, I want to watch this again, or if you were unable to, to watch it till the end, uh, we will post this, uh, uh, this webinar on the Sustainability Committee webpage, uh, and presumably to also go to the DFI uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so make uh, uh, you can find it there again. Uh, and then, uh, of course, if you want to uh, see any other webinars, uh, like the It's Money webinars uh, on the uh, first uh, Wednesday of every uh, even month. So the, the next one is going to be in the, uh, the first Wednesday in April. Uh, go to the DFI uh, website. And if you have any questions about uh, technical activities in DFI, you see on uh, your screen right now an email address that you can use to, to go there. 
with that, I want to thank uh, one more time uh, the uh, the speakers, uh, Eric, uh, Seth, uh, Victor, and then Sue. Uh, thank you for, for participating in this. Thank you for putting this, this opening statement together. Uh, and I want to thank the attendees for, for being here. Uh, it, it shows that uh, a webinar like this is useful. I know there are lots of webinars these days, uh, but it's, it's nice to see this kind of attendance. And hopefully uh, we, we have provided you with some ideas so that you can start implementing uh, sustainable efforts in your company. And like uh, the, the panelists mentioned at the end, uh, you really need to do that. Uh, otherwise uh, you may not be around uh, in, uh, in a few years time. So with that, thank you very much and hope to see you again soon at another DFI event. Thank you.